So um, the first thing to look at here is acid base properties. So let's take a look at it and go through. Now there's three basic definitions for acids and bases. Some of them you've probably been introduced to in general chemistry. So you recall there's the Arrhenius acid. And that's a compound that forms H3O plus when dissolved in water. So the key thing to note there is that water must be present for this definition to be held true. So the example that we give like in GChem is hydrochloric acid plus water gives you H3O plus, the hydronium ion, and chloride. And then a base, an Arrhenius base, is a compound that forms hydroxide when dissolved in water again. And here we have sodium hydroxide reacting with water to form hydroxide in Na+. Right? Not really much of a reaction there, more of a dissolving, but nonetheless, um, that's the, the acid-base reaction there. Um, and then the second type is a Bronsted-Lowry. So that deals with the, uh, the flow or the movement of protons. So um, an acid is a proton donor, and a base is a proton acceptor. And you may remember from GChem seeing something like this. Remember we have HA, or in this case I wrote AH, an acid reacting with some generic base. Let's put a negative charge on there. Didn't show up on the original. Um, but what would happen in essence is that the base would come over and kind of steal away that hydrogen to form the conjugate acid. And so base becomes our conjugate acid here. So here's our base. Over here, conjugate acid. And then the acid becomes the conjugate base on this side. Right? So if we go back that direction as far as the reaction, then your acid and base reaction would just be the reverse. And then in Ochem, we often talk about Lewis acids and Lewis bases because they deal with the movement or flow of electrons. And that's one of the things that we look at when we look at right things like resonance. We talked about that in our first chapter. And also, we're going to look at electron flow and mechanisms too. So a Lewis acid is a species that accepts a lone pair of electrons. Sometimes we call this in OCHEM the electrophile. And it takes a little while for that to sink in. Okay? And then we have a Lewis base. So a Lewis base is going to donate a lone pair. And again, in OCHEM, we often call this just the nucleophile. So let's look at this example down below and see if we can uh, make some sense of who the Lewis acid and who the Lewis base is. Remember, the Lewis base is the thing that's going to donate a lone pair. So if we're putting in our arrows here, what's happening actually is that the lone pair on nitrogen is coming over and bumping into this H of H3O+. Right? This is just another way of writing H3O+. So arrow-wise, these electrons are going to come over and grab a hold of that hydrogen. And then this set of bonding electrons is going to come over and live on the oxygen atom. Now, don't worry too much about the flow of arrows right now. It's something that we're going to kind of digest as we get through chapter 3 and through chapter 4 and start introducing more reactions. But I just want to put them out there for you guys. Now, what this makes this is a Lewis base. Bases donate lone pairs. It is also your nucleophile. Right now, if that's true, then the other thing better be your Lewis acid, and it is. Here's your. I was going to write this La Lewis acid, and then that's your electrophile. Right, and then let's look at the next one down here below. So let's pull this down and let me zoom in a little bit, and let's look at this. So same same type of reaction that's taking place here, um, not necessarily an acid base reaction per se, but um, here we have the lone pair of nitrogen coming over and making a bond with the carbon of CH3, right? So if we look on this side, this is NH3 covalently bound to a CH3. 
right? So that's our new bond that's formed right there. That bond comes from the lone pair that's here. So that lone pair is coming over and literally we're going to talk about this in chapter six. But literally that lone pair in NH3 actually rams in and, and hits the carbon of CH3. And it does so with sufficient energy that it can overcome the activation energy of forming a new bond. And that chlorine uh, carbon bond breaks and then the electrons go live on chlorine to become chloride. Right, so again, in this case, here we have our nucleophile, and then this would be our electrophile. So we want to remember those terms, and, and we'll practice, we'll talk about these as we go through um, really the rest of the year. But, you know, start wrapping your brain around nucleophiles and electrophiles in terms of Lewis acid base theory. Now, one of the things we look at in organic chemistry is we talk about acid strength. And we're not so much super concerned with acids, but acids, remember, when they lose an H, become a conjugate base. And bases are nucleophiles. And in OCHEM, we are concerned with nucleophiles. So to discuss nucleophile strength, we tend to look at acid strength because they're kind of related, right? Now to review a little bit with you guys here, remember we have that Bronsted-Lowry acid base equation. That's the that's the type of acid base reaction we're going to look at here to describe acid strength. In that situation, you have an acid over here with a base. And for us, that base is going to be water. It doesn't always have to be, though, but it will be water for us. And, that, and under those situ situations, water will be your solvent. And then over here, you form your conjugate acid and your conjugate base. Now. Um, if you recall, we can figure out the KEQ for this reaction. It's Again, it's equal to right, the concentration of our products raised to their stoichiometric coefficient divided by the reactants raised to their stoichiometric coefficient. Okay. Now, because we chose water as our standard base when we do all these acid-base comparisons, we can kind of just absorb it into KEQ and then we get down here, RKA. And in GCAM, you probably remember looking these things up and doing equilibrium calculations and all sorts of stuff with that. Now, the, the, the use of these in OCHEM is a little bit different. We don't tend to get calculators out and do ice tables and stuff like that. We tend to look at the magnitude of it, though. And we don't really love looking at KA because those are usually times 10 to the sum power. And that's hard to remember. It's harder at least. So remember that a large Ka, if you have a large Ka, it means that your products dominate. Right? So you get a large Ka because the numerator is large. Right? So if the numerator is large, then we have a stronger acid. Right? Because if we're a strong acid, we live over on this side 100% of the time. Right? Now what we do is we take the negative log of our Ka. And that makes big Ka's small numbers. So negative log takes big numbers and makes them small. So a small pKa means that the products dominate. It means that we have a stronger acid. So what, what I was made to do as a student is to memorize a table of pKa's. These days we, we kind of look these things up. They're good to keep um, handy. So if we look at our general reaction here, guys. So here's HA, right, plus in this case our solvent slash base, which is water, right? And we get H3O plus and the conjugate base A minus, right? So really those are H3O plus, right? And of course that's H2O. So, okay. Now we have to keep this base constant as we go through and that way we can compare what our pKa's are. So HI, hydroiodic acid, has the smallest pKa. So a small pKa means that we have a stronger acid. So over here, that's our strongest acid. So HI, HBr, HCl, right? Here's H3O plus at 1.7. It's another common one that shows up. Right, and then we have other functional groups. So this is acetic acid down here that you may remember. 
we have HCN, hydrocyanic acid. Here we have water down here. Um, and some other groups that are going to be important as we go throughout our semester. Now in your OCHEM book, you can probably crack that thing open and somewhere in the back there's going to be an index back there or a table and a lot of times there's maybe two or three pages of specific pka values there and that's that's nice to have for reference but no one's going to memorize that instead we kind of use these numbers as a starting point as we discuss our acid base strength so let's take a look and see how we can use these PKAs in um, some simple acid-base reactions. So an important thing to point out here is that acid-base reactions favor the weaker acid and the weaker base. Now since we're talking about PKAs, we're typically looking at acid strength here. And the other thing is that we can get a pretty good estimation of KQ by taking the difference of the PKAs of the product acid minus the PKAs of the reactant acid. Now that can be pretty convenient in determining where the equilibrium position kind of numerically lies. So if we look down here below, we can look up these pKa's. So you can look at that previous page. The pK of this is 4.74. And this is an acid. The pK of this is 9.4. Right now, acid base. This is coming over if you're following along with the arrows it's going to come over and grab a hold of that H atom. And then these electrons are going to come over and live on the oxygen. And of course, there's two lone pair on there right now. So down here, you would have this. That's your conjugate base. And NH4+. Now, when you look at that, and you have to make this prediction, because you're, you're going to be asked to do this probably, uh, where does the equilibrium lie? Well, it lies to the side with the weaker acid. Remember, a smaller pKa means that we have a stronger acid. So we're looking for the larger pKa. So that's the weaker acid. So reaction here favors our products. All right. So then let's look down below at the next one here. What about this next problem? So same deal. Let's see if we can pick out our acid in our, in our base. So this over here is our acid. That's a pK of 9.4. It's NH4+, right? Just a different way of writing it. Here's our acid. This is going to be our base, right? And then over here, this is not exactly acetic acid, but it looks like it. So it's going to have a pKa close to 4. Point, we'll call it 4.8 because that's close enough to this, right? So it'll be close to the pKa of uh, acetic acid, which we saw up above. And then we take a look at it and we go, okay, well, which, which number is the smallest? We just did this on the, the above example. That's smaller. So here we favor our reactants. Now down below, let's look at the last one. See if we can figure out our acid and our base down here. So that's going to be our base. This is our nucleophile. This guy right here is your electrophile. It's your acid. This has a pKa of negative 1.7. And then over on this side, we're looking at, at this. This is an alcohol. This has a pKa of somewhere around, we'll call it 16. Okay. So which side of this reaction do we favor? We favor this side. So reaction again favors our products. Right? And it's as simple as that, guys.